welcome to Look Down There, the show where we talk about all the things we don't talk about. I'm your host, Michelle Lamore. Today, my guest is a half black, half Mohawk, international burlesque performer, teacher, and activist hailing from Ganawage, Quebec. She is currently ranked number as the number one burlesque performer in Canada. You stole her land and now she'll steal your hearts. Here she is, my friend, Lulu, la Duchess de Rire. Bonjour, my friend. Hey, girl. Yes, here she is from Montreal. So happy to have you here. Thank you so much for doing the show. Oh, thank you for having me. It's like so good to see you, even on like camera. I'm like, <laughs> I know your little face. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, burlesque, right? We we have to ask the question. How did you get into it? How did you find your way there? I guess it's a kind of uh, an unusual trajectory because I started so young. Um, I started a week after my 18th birthday. And I'm going to date myself because I, I started it um, because of a MySpace ad. <laughs> I don't know if the kids know what MySpace is, but it was a hot social media thing. And um, I was in college and I basically before college I had done musical theater on my reserve for 13 years from the age of five to like 17 and a half and I had to quit because of um, just school was overwhelming and um, I had labs I had all this stuff like that so I had to, to stop going to theater and I really had um, my first real bout of depression in that period of time. Um, and I found out it was because I didn't have a creative outlet. I had nothing to do with myself. I was just in school and, and that was my entire life. So I had a really good friend at the time that saw this MySpace ad and sent it to me. And she's like, look, there's like a live burlesque audition. Uh, and she's like, it's kind of like musical theater. It's dancing and costuming. Cause I was also the costume mistress <laughs> at my theater. So I would sew all the costumes. So you get to do all your costumes and your choreography, everything that you love. And she's like, and if you don't like, if you mess up, it's only you. So I was like, yeah, I could give this a shot. And I had known what burlesque was because uh, we had done the play Gypsy when I was 12. And what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's what? happening in Canada? What's going on? <laughs> do you know, do you want to know who I played? I was actually probably 13. Um, I was Electra. So I don't know if you're familiar with the play. And I had like, I made the coolest costume. I had like this light up bra. I got to work with the lighting guys. So it was like, they would turn all the house lights down and then like my little non-existent boobs would just go like this. Did oh my, my gosh. The prodigy, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's where you got your first taste of um, the shimmy shake. Yeah. Yes. Um, and also my grandmother, when I told her that I was going to do it, because I was still living on the reserve at this point and I was terrified. My mom knew I was going to do it. And my mom was super supportive, but I just couldn't bear the fact of my grandmother finding out and being like heartbroken. And I told her that I was going to start doing burlesque and I remember just like mincing my words and tiptoeing. I'm like, oh, it's kind of like theater, but it's a little bit like more like, like a salacious. And she's like, are you talking about burlesque? And I was like, how do you know what burlesque is? And my grandmother, uh, she grew up in Buffalo, New York. And when she was, I think eight years old, she like snuck in to see Gypsy Rose Lee to perf perform in like this theater in, in Buffalo, New York. So I was just like, it was like, she knew burlesque and her parting words to me were like, if you're going to do it, like don't half-ass it. You have to be like the best at what you do. Um, and she's like, just, you know, that was always the mentality of my house. If you're going to do something, be the best at it and just, you know, don't screw around. Um, so I did it. I had a, it was a live audition to be in this burlesque shoot called Blue Light Burlesque. And there was like probably like two or 300 people in this bar. And I still remember like my first dance, I did it. I think I still remember all the choreography. I worked like a week on it. Uh, so your audition was an actual show. It was, okay. Yeah. Um, and I did a, a chair dance to Stop This World by Diana Krall. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and it was like all black with like little pink 
rhinestone accents. Actually, no, this is not, I'm making it up. There were no rhinestones when I started burlesque. We did not do rhinestones. Um, we had sequins um, and a dream and that's it. And some hot glue. It's the name of my memoir. <laughs> yeah. Sequins and a dream. Yeah. I did. I did not use rhinestones when I started and I won Miss Exotic World. I don't think I had one rhinestone on that costume. I know. 2005. Yeah. Oh, how the times have changed. Yeah. How about it? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I do remember like hot gluing crap to other crap. <laughs> yeah. Just glue and shit to shit, stick and shit to shit. It, that's pretty much all it is. Like I would have no career if it weren't for uh, safety pins and uh, pasty tape, really. Absolutely. I remember um, one of my favorite numbers that I got to do because um, I, I, I ended up winning the contract with this this company. I worked for them for two years. And at first I got to do one act a show and then it was like two solos and a duo and then like two solos, a duo. And so by the end of my time there, I was doing like four acts in a show every month and it was new material every month. So I had to make new acts, new costumes. And one of my favorite acts I did, we did a, a sci-fi themed burlesque show. And I did uh, The Fly, like the movie The Fly. And I made like a giant cutout time machine <laughs> contraption with a working door. And I came out and I like had this like sexy, like little science outfit. It was all very like basic. And I came out and I had this like giant like fly costume underneath that I made with like wings. And I did this like strip tease to human fly by the cramps. And at yeah. the end, I took my bra off. I had somebody chase me around with a giant fly swatter and I never, like nobody ever got to see my boobs. <laughs> I have footage of any of these acts because they're so ridiculous and so silly. Yeah. And yeah, I, yeah, I can't ever whip those out of retirement. I don't think. But they yeah, it, that was a moment in time. If you missed it, you missed it. If you were there. Yeah. yeah right. If you know, you know. Ooh. Yes. So tell me about your time on the reservation and how that impacted you um, in, in finding your voice and finding your your art. Oh, uh, yes. So I wasn't born on the reservation. I was actually born in Kansas, which not a lot of people know. Uh, my parents are both in the military. Uh, they were both in the military. Uh, so I was born in Kansas. I lived in Germany for two or three years and then we moved to Canada and the timing of this move is like really important um so I don't know I'm assuming a lot of your viewers are from the U.S. or other parts of the world mm. for anyone that's not uh from Canada there was a very important uh event that happened in 1990 involving my community um and it was referred to as the Oka crisis so in short basically um some uh like white developers wanted to build a golf course on Indian burial ground in a different reserve. It's just like, you know, it's the premise of every Stephen King book, uh, but right. like we were trying to build um, like Ill illegally acquire this land and build a golf course. So my community um, in support of this other community, um, we blocked a bridge, uh, which was a peaceful form of protest, but we blocked it for the entire summer um, and it spiraled very quickly into like just this horrible standoff. Canada sent in um, basically the military, but they, they sent in, um, I think that I read a statistic, they sent in more uh, military aid to fight indigenous people in 1990 than they did to respond to like the COVID crisis. Um, and they were given orders to treat it like a martial law practice. So, um, I mean, things that happen on the reserve, um, a dear friend of mine, uh, she, she was 15 at the time. She was stabbed with a bayonet by an officer, like trying to protect her five-year-old sister. When they finally opened up the, the bridge to allow elderly people to seek medical um, aid, um, one woman gave birth on the bridge. Um, and then the non-native community that's like directly um, in the community that meets the bridge in Montreal. They had all flanked the sides of the bridge because it's a trench. Um, it's known as Whiskey Trench. So uh, they threw rocks and boulders and they killed an elder elderly man uh, from my community. And 
the other neighboring communities wouldn't allow anybody to come in to provide food or medical attention. So it was like this horrific summer of just like racism and burning effigies and like like 1950s style races. I actually, you know what, that's an antiquated thing. It is very much still the type of racism that we see today. Yeah. But, you know, it's like, it's, you know, so that was the time um, we were still in Germany when this happened. And for any younger people, this was 89, 90. Um, I believe Germany, like the media that was happening there was not like up to date. You know, <laughs> we weren't getting MTV. We weren't getting like, we all that stuff had to be like imported from the US. And it was such big news. What was going on in my little community, it reached Germany and my mother was watching her community on the news in Germany and just being like, oh my God, like, um, so we moved back right after that crisis. And, you know, unfortunately, one of the kind of things that happened was from the community receiving so much like racism and internalizing that, um, they became more hardlined in like the kind of things that they would allow in the community. So like, being a child of mixed parentage, uh, my father is black, um, it was not received at all. Um, and it was like my mother was kicked off the ban list. So that means that she was basically, um, both of her parents are, are Mohawk. Uh, my grandfather at one point was like a chief on our council. Like we, we come from like a, a family that's like a very established family in the community, whatever that means. Anyways, it was just really, um, it was really, hard to watch my mother and like not fully understand it. But um, like one of my earliest memories of Gunawage was like sitting on my grandmother's porch and a pickup truck passed in front and we were sitting there like um, having a barbecue with all my aunts and my uncles and my cousins. And just a, like a mob of people were in the truck and they were screaming at my mother to get out of town because she didn't belong there. And she had left the community and it was really, hard um and my sister and I were very bullied growing up uh like to the point where uh, like I had my arm broken twice oh was, my gosh um and yeah it was it was really really difficult I'm not gonna lie it was a very difficult thing to grow up in that community and not to like internalize that like anger um and I'm really lucky that I had that the type of parent that I did because my mother was very adamant about us finding or like not finding our place, but assuring us that we had a place in the community. Whenever I was like, well, I don't feel like, like, you know, you want to leave when you're like getting bullied. I was like, can we just move? I want to move with dad. I want to, you know, and I was like, no, like, screw that. She's like, you are like Mohawk, like you're a Mohawk woman. And like, there's also something special about being a woman in my society. We're one of the only matriarchal societies in the world. So like the culture is passed on through the mother. Um, and that was something that was like, instilled in us like from birth um and you know as we grow into women there's kind of a duty with that of like knowing your culture so that you can pass it on if you have children um and yeah so I had this like very tough past mom that was like take no shit um taught us how to fight taught us how to stand up for ourselves so I mean like I think that like one of the ugliest things about my personality <laughs> is I do know how to fight very, very well. Um, and I am very like nonviolent, very passive, but um, yeah, that was always the joke was just like, you know, we grew up in a like, like kind of like, like caged animals a bit. Like um, now what that ended up like manifesting into was when I was able to leave the community, I was 11 when I started high school and I got to choose where I went to high school. So I said, I want to go to a school where absolutely I'm not going to know anybody and it's just going to be me and I could just like be myself. So I chose to go to a private Catholic all girls school in the West Island. Wow, Lulu, that's intense. Yeah, and <laughs> I'm going to go to this like stack up school and there I encountered a completely different type of racism. And like, I... <laughs> It was still taught by, uh, like, it was still run by nuns. Um, so, and we'll circle back to this because, like, with all the findings of uh, the children's uh, bodies in Canada, for anyone that doesn't know, um, we're in a big reckoning as uh, a country right now because they found up to, like, over 6,000 
bodies of, of children that were murdered at residential schools. And um, when was when was this? Um, so residential schools have been around. Uh, the last residential school closed in the 90s. Uh, so it's not like a thing of it's not an antiquated thing. And it was basically like a control system. Um, the government and the church uh, would go into indigenous communities, take children from their parents and put them in these schools where they would, um, well, they were very abused uh, physically, sexually, um, and uh, often like, well, murdered. <laughs> A lot of these children never came home. Um, the ones that did complete school were often just um, adopted into white families and they were beaten to the point where like if they spoke their language um they were like very like the, the, the stories that come out of these these schools are are very very traumatizing and horrible um so in our communities now there's like a generational gap where our grandparents spoke mohawk but our parents do not mm. children were they're like their children were taught to speak the language so now there's like a resurgence of people in my generation that are learning, like we're having to, to learn before the language dies and, and to pass on these traditions and these customs. We'll get back to that because basically the school that I went to, I did not know at the time, was a retirement home for the Sisters of St. Anne's, which is an order of nuns um, in Canada. And they played a very crucial role in hiding the documentation of all these children that were murdered. Uh, so they were like living above where I was going to school. Um, but yeah, the, one of them was a principal at my school when I went and she pulled me into her office, I think the second week of school. And she said, uh, again, I was 11. I was terrified and of just, yeah, I was just the little thing that was just afraid of everything. And I didn't want to mess up because I knew it was going to be a tough school. And, uh, she's like, okay, Lauren, you're from Ganawage? You're from the reserve? And I'm like, yeah. And then she's like, uh, looking through my file and she goes, your cousin went here like 20 years ago. Da, 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 da. Okay. Da, da, da. And she goes, do me a favor and try not to get pregnant or get into any fights. I was wow. 11 years old. And that was the expectation was that I was going to get kicked out um, immediately for doing one of these two things. Um, and she, I think she followed up with like, I know how you people are like, this is all you do. So um, I will, there is like a, a part of my personality that I think was always there. Like I've always been a bit of like an upstart, like I've, but there have been key moments in my life that have definitely pushed me into the person that I am. Mm -hmm. uh, that was definitely one of them. So I like really put my nose in the books and I was the first person from my community to graduate in 14 years. I graduated with honors and I gave like, I won the governor's general award for history. Cause I was just like, I wanted to prove a point that I was like, you know, I could succeed and that I was, you know, yeah. So like, I don't know. I definitely have like a complex about like overachieving to prove a point, like vindictively overachieving. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I it, like to throw people off, right. It, they have expectations of you like, oh, they think you're going to be this way. And then they, they don't see you coming. Right. Ooh. And I know you studied law and I mean, you're very smart. And I think when people, I mean, I feel this way a little bit too, like as someone who takes their clothes off, I've always felt really passionate about disproving that dumb stripper trope. You know, yeah. like I, I don't, I don't want to be seen that way. So I always feel like hyper aware of that. And it's funny too. Like I get into, especially specifically with the, the law school thing, I get into those conversations a lot where I'm like, do you, do you, do you regret not finishing law school? I'm like, absolutely not. I hated it. <laughs> I'm like, I literally did it to prove a point. Like, I just, that's like the most, I'm like, I love performing and I love like what I do now. Um, but yeah, I think uh, back to like the original 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 kind of question about growing up in that community um yeah it, there was this like moments where like I wanted to leave and I was like determined to to get out and um I had a conversation with my mom when I was about I think before I turned 18 I was still quite young because um basically under the Indian Act because my mother was Mohawk and my father was non-native 
I fell under this clause wherein I was protected up until 18. So federally, the government, um, or within my community, I was allowed to live in the community up until the point of being 18. And then I had to make a decision whether or not I wanted to apply for my membership. Um, and I guess my mom- So what does that mean, apply for your membership? At the time, it meant something horrible. It meant that I had to go through this really invasive legal process, but it was like a tribunal legal process because we're allowed to have, um, under the Indian Act, you have federal law, you have provincial law, but then you also have banned law. Um, and we have the power of self-governance. So that basically means like, within our own communities, we can kind of write our own laws as to how we want to self-govern. Um, so membership, like you can be federally recognized as an indigenous person. And also this is like, just like a disclaimer, recognition federally or banned recognition does not mean that you are not an indigenous person at all. It doesn't, it just, it is literal legal legalese. It's a very divisive construct to basically separate us and to, to make us like self-police. So I do not agree with any of these things. Um, that's just like a disclaimer if I had, cause I, I like as somebody, I am federally and band recognized. Like I have a lot of friends that are neither of those things. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, am I still there? Yeah. Yeah, so Anyways, I had this opportunity to uh, apply for my membership, which meant that at 18, I had to go in front of a council of elders. Uh, they were 12 elders within my community, and I had to plead a case uh, as to why I deserve to live in the community and how, like, basically to prove that I was, like, Mohawk enough. Wow. Uh, you, and, and they asked horribly invasive questions. I remember one of the questions... Um, was like, do you want to have children? And do you, is having Mohawk children important to you? And I was like, I am 18 years old. I don't know what I want to eat tomorrow. Like, I don't know if I want to have kids. Like, um, and at the time I was, I was living with this um, wonderful, like man who was very queer, like very like bisexual. We were like not romantically involved at all. And we were just like the best of friends and that got brought in, brought in up. Like they, they brought that up during my hearing. It was like, um, is this a sexual relationship? Like, who are you basically, who are you sleeping with? What are your, like, so it was, yeah. Uh, and also having to sign my, uh, cause I had to be my representation in order to even start the application for my, my membership at the time I had to sign away my rights to a lawyer and to any kind of uh, like challenge, legal challenges so yeah, I do not agree with this process at all, um, but I did it uh, because my friend was doing a documentary for the National Film Board of Canada called Club Native, and it deals specifically with uh, these membership issues. So for anyone watching uh, that wants like an in-depth kind of uh, understanding of membership issues specifically for my community, because not all communities are like this. I come from a, a very hardline community. Um, you can watch this documentary. It's available online. It's called Club Native. It's by Tracy Deer, um, and it's uh, released through the National Film Board of Canada and Resolution Pictures. And I am um, a subject in that documentary. So again, like kind of like to um, prove a point, <laughs> I applied for my membership and I got it. Um, but yeah, before I made the decision to do that, I had this like really big conversation with my mom that was very... Um, I didn't realize it at the time, but it, it definitely set in course, like a, a motion of like the, tra the trajectory of how I see my life and what I wanted in my life. And I remember being 16 and she's like, well, do you think you're gonna apply? Like you might wanna look into the process now or start filling out forms. And I looked at her, I was like, mom, as soon as I can, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> I'm like, I'm getting out of here. And I'm like, I don't need a piece of paper and I don't need the government to tell me that I'm, I'm Mohawk. I'm like, I know my traditions. Like I know my stories. I'm like, I grew up here. I'm like, this is my home. This I was going to be my home. And I'm like, I also don't need anybody from this community to tell me that I'm going to be like, that I'm native enough. And I'm like, cause I know I'm going to do something great with my life, mom. And I'm like, and I'm going to be a direct reflection of this community, whether they want me or not. And that, like, I had that resolve at, like, 16 years old, which I think is, like, pretty prolific for, like, an angsty, like, teenager. I do listen. I, <laughs> I did 
and still currently I'm listening to a lot of like Morrissey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very angsty, um, yeah. very angry. And I was able to channel that into this, like, it doesn't matter. So to bring that like full circle, like I, I do have such a love for my community um, and an appreciation, but like traveling and connecting with other indigenous people, other indigenous artists, from different communities it's like really that's been like the most impactful thing in recent years is hearing other people's stories and how they are struggling with identity and um this kind of longing for closeness to our culture and to our communities and feeling that i wasn't alone like all these years i've felt very alone in my experience and like understanding that nobody feels enough and nobody feels the sense of yeah, like community almost, or like there's certainty in, in their communities. It, it, it really allowed me to kind of forgive myself of a lot of these feelings that I had as a child. And yeah, I don't know. I feel like I've come full circle on this where I was like, I needed to be angry when I was younger. I needed to get out. I needed to do all this work. And now like, I'm in a place where my work is about going back to the community and like bringing stuff like this goodness in and uh, building networks uh, with other indigenous people, other indigenous artists and uh, also allies and all this stuff like that, talking about these really important issues. So, yeah. So you've kind of, you, you wanted to break away, but you you're feeling more of a calling to home and that connection to your ancestors. And I, I remember um, you were at my house and I think you were just starting that process where you were starting to reconnect to that community. And um, you were going through rituals and you were beating and, and making all this incredible artwork. Um, tell me about that ritual oh um well there's lots of stuff like we again okay so I the community I grew up in uh, was settled by Jesuits so there's like surprisingly a lot of like religious influence in the community uh, my household was really really messed up because my grandmother was super catholic my grandfather was traditional that's like what we call people that live by like the older ways and my mom was a Jehovah's Witness so like oh oh my yeah. gosh you tell, I had to go to Kingdom Hall on Saturday I had to go to church on Sunday I, like, and then I would like sneak away with my grandfather and he would like teach me about like medicines and like uh you know it, and it's very like seasonal it's very earth-based like our but it's not just like religion like being part of the longhouse which I do not claim to be part of the longhouse but um that way of life it's more than religion. It's, it's truly a way of life. It's, it dictates how we eat, how, like when we hunt, uh, what are the customs around death and the custom, and it's, it's so beautiful. And, you know, especially, you know, it is the purest way of living. And it is also like this deep appreciation. Like we are truly custodians of the land. Um, and it's a message that I think everybody needs to, to hear. I was actually uh, performing, uh, well, not performing. I was in a, a meeting yesterday. Uh, I'm part of like an indigenous dance collective. Like, um, and we had an elder from my community come in to open up the, the circle. And he was giving us these teachings about the land. And basically he said, we have such little time and he is like the only way out of the situation that we're in, in regards to climate change and also like uh, capitalism. He's like, these are all constructs, uh, constructs of masculine energy. And he's like, and the only way to, to heal is to return to the mother and to return to the feminine. And he is like, and also and like, and also these are all Iroquois principles, right? It's like, we, we don't really believe in ownership. Like we, like we don't own anything. You don't own the house. Like these are constructs. Uh, you can't own people or ideas. Everything is a gift. Every 
including the earth. So like this whole idea that like we return to our mother. I know it's, I'm getting to get really hippy dippy, but it's been so nice because in the past few years, I've been really privileged to, to, to get these teachings and things like, I don't know, the idea of death, right? Like just dealing with death, um, just become like terrifying, you know, it's, it's not, it's just this, this idea of just like, you're returning to like this bigger, th- like cosmic thing. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm like, just like getting these teachings and, and adjusting how I see things and just chilling the fuck out. <laughs> yeah. like- I mean, to, to put it, you know, bluntly, I guess, but I, it gives you perspective, right? And it puts you in touch with your humanity mm-hmm. and your connection to the earth and to each other and how we just get wrapped up and so isolated. And yes, these ideas are masculine. This is a patriarchal capitalist world that we're in. And so how do we fight against that when we are in this, in the soup, we we've grown up in it. We're marinating in it. Um, we have to return home, right? We have to nurture the feminine, uh, as much as we nurture our masculine. And I mean that for everybody. Um, and I, you talked about growing up in a matriarchal society, a, a community. And I'm just like, wow, what is that fantasy land like? Um, so <laughs> how, um, like, has that impacted, uh, your confidence, um, surrounding just, you know, you as a, as a sexual and pleasurable being, um, as an artist, um, how did, did growing up with those matriarchal values, um, influence you and, and how do you, is it easy for you to still remain with those values and not be so tainted by the world that we're living in? Yeah, I think I definitely, I had to confront some things. I think a few years ago, I did that thing where you watch a video of yourself and then you read the comments underneath. You're not supposed to do that. I did that one time and I was like, oh my goodness, people are so mean. Um, But there was one comment that really like, really, really cut deep. And it was from another indigenous person. It was an indigenous man from a different community. Um, And I think this was after I won Queen uh, in New Orleans. So my video was up at the time. It is no longer up. Um, I digress. Um, I'll take a sip of tea first. (laughs) Because some real tea is coming. Um, So basically we ended up, what this person had said was uh, something like, you should be ashamed of yourself. Uh, This is only uh, propagating like sexualization of indigenous women and you're not a role model. Um, and this is basically affecting like this and worsening the pandemic of, or the, sorry, the epidemic of like missing and murdered native women across Turtle Island. And it really hit me hard because I also grew up in a community where you have to listen to people. Like you have to, this idea of like, I'm right, I'm wrong. It doesn't exist in my community. Like you have, especially somebody that's older than you, especially another indigenous person. So I'm just like, oh goodness. It's like my worst fear is just like having these kind of, like being confronted by somebody from a community and offending somebody from like, you know, my community. So I was, I took a step back and I really like processed it. And then I got really mad and I was like, who the hell does this guy think he is? And then I looked at where he was from and I was like, he's not from my community. And I'm like, he's not from, he's not Mohawk. He's from a different community. And the reason that matters is because I think a Mohawk man has <laughs> no better than to come at a Mohawk woman about what she can and cannot do with her body. And that's definitely not how I was raised. And I had my grandmother's voice in my head at this point of like, who the hell does he think he is? And that's like something that I really, I was like, respectfully, who the hell do you think you are? And I'm like, my celebration and reclamation of my body and of my sexuality has nothing to do with these horrible things that are going on. And like really separating myself from that. And I'm like, this is like 
toxic masculinity and colonialism cloaked in traditional like perseverance. And that is like the most insidious thing. And yes, I understand the root of this anger and the root of this concern is that we are losing women that we are and two spirit and queer people that we deeply love. We're losing our, our sisters and it doesn't seem like anybody cares. Mm -hmm. That is not like, that is not the fault of women. That is not the fault of these people that are like, uh, that of sexualized people. You know, this is, it's victim blaming. It is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's slut shaming. It's all of those things, but it's also like so much more because it is, it, it's a colonial construct. So I'm like, it is, it's so insidious and so deep running where I'm like, you think that this is the right way that we have to teach our women to be cloaked and modest and stuff like that. And I totally understand the, the reason for it, but I don't think it's the right way. And I think that, um, you know, every society throughout history has been given the allowance to kind of grow and evolve and ideologies to like progress and all this stuff like that. And whenever we refer to indigenous teachings or indigenous cultures, one, it's always a monolith, which it is not. Two, it is always frozen in time. So as an indigenous artist, the amount of times where I get asked to do something that is like, you know, cultural, the, and what the and to, expectation of what I'm going to present is I'm going to come out like in buckskin and beads and like, and I'm like, that's, that's not the type of work that I'm interested in. And that's no disrespect to people that do that type of work or that want to present that way. But I've always found it more interesting to like kind of talk about what it means to be an Indigenous person in the 21st century. Yes. And also, what does that mean in terms of our traditions and our custom? Those should be able to like evolve and uh and change so yeah i definitely like i i do feel this inner strength and this inner like like kind of not aggression but like I'm, i've always been able to stand up for myself and i've always been able to to take a moment and listen but then be like you know I, I, I don't think I allow myself to be pushed around too much. And I do think that has a lot to do with how I was raised and watching the women around me. Like nobody took anything from anybody. You know, you know where the power lies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now you're a mom. Yes. And how old is, is she now? Clara will be seven in, Clara Wolf will be seven in four days. Oh my goodness. Okay. So now you're a mom, like, how are you passing this down to Clara and, and making sure that this culture and these traditions and rituals get passed down to her? Um, well, so language is a big part of it. Um, and like I, I, I talked about before, like that connection to my language was cut um, with my grandparents. Um, so I've been doing my best to relearn and to speak to her in Mohawk. How um, are you going about learning? Slowly. Um, I used to be able to speak when I was a child. Um, but are you going, are there like other people in your community who you are going to, to learn or, cause your mom doesn't speak, right? No, no, my mom doesn't speak. Um, and there are like, there are tools to, to access it, um, like um, apps and programs and stuff like that. So when I was pregnant, I did a Mohawk immersion program, which was very, very difficult. And I got three weeks into class and I gave birth. <laughs> I gave birth to Clara. So like I um, had to stop that, but I still understand how to read. Um, Cause uh, in our language, we're only, we only have 12, alpha, uh, 12 letters in our alphabet. So our words are very, very long. Like my Mohawk name is 14 letters long. Um, so I've been making a commitment to like little things, like relearning little things, little words and incorporating that into like day-to-day -day life. Um, and recently, like this past three months, I made a commitment to relearn the Handagariya Dekwa, which is our, uh, it's our Thanksgiving prayer. And it's how we thank, it's, ideally how you start and finish every day, but the prayer is so long. Um, and when you speak it in Mohawk and you thank everything, you start with like, 
we think the sky, we think the rocks, we think the medicines, we think the winds, we think, we think everything. Um, so it takes quite a long time to do it properly. And it, I did it, and it, it took me about 15 minutes to do it in my language, but it's, it was super important that I, I was able to do it in my language. So yeah, it's like stuff like that. And then I also dance. Um, so I've been doing uh, powwow dancing for, yeah, I guess like since Clara has been born and I kind of bring her into those circles. Um, and yeah, just like working in beating and uh, every time she has any kind of big thing at school, she graduated from uh, kindergarten uh, and she graduated from daycare. So I, you know, beat her moccasins and I make her a ribbon dress and she knows all the teachings around those things. All of her books are about like indigenous people and like just like little things like that. And then also I live very close to the community that I grew up in. So she spends a lot of time with her dada, which is Mohawk for grandma. And yeah, she spends a lot of time in the community. So it's, it's, you do what you can. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. And I, I love the idea and of starting and ending your day with gratitude, having a very intentional moment of gratitude. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, the elder yesterday said something about people are always looking forward to Christmas. And he's, he said, everyone's looking forward to Christmas all the time. And he's like, every day is Christmas. He's like, you open two gifts every morning, you open your eyes and he's like, you're still there. And I was like, so simple and so beautiful. <laughs> there's this real um beauty to listening to like elders speak the great yeah. story and yeah definitely. so I'll ask one last question as we are kind of getting back to life whatever that is in this moment and performing do you feel differently about performance and um, whether that manifests itself in, in different acts or whatever, but do you feel different energetically, like what you're bringing to the stage and how you're approaching it and how you're thinking about it? Okay. So I definitely felt differently <laughs> pre pandemic. Uh, like I guess around 2018, um, I won my first title and that's, I think, when I really start to have a shift in the type of energy that I was bringing to performance. Um, I felt like there were very conscious decisions that I made at the beginning of my career. Um, and in response to some like pretty uncomfortable, crappy conversations I've had throughout my career about um, how I presented and the types of acts that people wanted to see from me. Uh, and I remember somebody telling me once, oh, well, you're native or no, that wasn't, I'm sorry, that was kindness. They asked, oh, you're Indian, you're an Indian. And I was like, uh-huh. And then they're like, okay, well, um, you should do like a Pocahontas act or something like that would be really great. And I was like, Ugh. and I like, a, this is like a very big producer at the beginning of my career. And I knew not to say anything, but I also was just like, I will never give this person the satisfaction of seeing you do something like that or anybody else for that matter. Um, so I made a decision from that point that I was like, I'm not even going to touch anything um, because this is what people want to see for me. This is the only type of burlesque they think I can do. And I'm like, I'm going to do classic burlesque and I'm going to kick its ass. I'm going to go and I'm going to do the, the gown and the gloves and the, the peels and like, you know, the splits and all this glamour. I'm going to only do glamour. Um, and then, you know, I did that. I did the thing. I won the crown. And then I was just like, okay, what's next? I've made my point. Uh, and then at that point, I was like, what is it? I'm 16. I'm bad at math. I was like probably 13 years into my career at that point. And I was just like, okay, what do I want to do now? Um, and I felt like really confident. Like, and I also, this was like after, like, I, I was a mom I like was doing like I was dancing in powwows I was with my community um and like my whole life has been like entrenched in politics and being in the community and like from I from a very early age like not having a choice but to be political and to be involved in these like big discussions about identity and like belonging and all this stuff like that so like in my 30s being like okay so where are you now 
who are you as not just a, as Lulu, but as Lauren, as an indigenous person, as a, as a black woman, as a queer person, like wh- who are you and, and how are you doing? <laughs> I did this checkup on myself and that's how like my purple act was, was created. Um, and the name of that act is peace, power, and righteousness, which is our, the, which those are the principles of the, the Confederacy that I belong to as an Iroquois woman. Um, and yeah, I feel like that act is, is, is really intense. It's really like, it, it, and it's kind of the antithesis of a, of a striptease because it's not about the striptease. It's, it's a very aggressive, um, very sexual, like animal act. Um, and yeah, I love it. For me, it was like cathartic and it was this like kind of like scream into the void of like, this isn't um, a reciprocal like kind of performance. Like I'm not performing for like applause. This is, this is a one, it's like kind of the, the opposite of what we teach people about burlesque, right? Where it's, it's not all about you. <laughs> so, you know, like there has to be for like, but this is the, this is my actor. It's like, this is not about anybody in the audience. This is about me and my five minutes on this stage and you're going to watch. And this is what I'm showing you and you're welcome. <laughs> and, it was, and it's just all about identity and like being an indigenous woman and specifically being like an angry indigenous woman about like not having any or at the time, you know, the, the, those conversations about like not having like ownership over my body or my sexuality, being demonized for for being a sexual individual. Um, so, yeah, that was pre-pandemic, um, and having fun, being like, I don't give a shit anymore. I'm just gonna do what I want to do, and you're gonna get some weird art. You're gonna get some, you know, whatever I feel. Um, then, pandemic hits. And we had talked a bit about this. I was kind of like in stasis. I was homeschooling. Uh, so yeah, I was, I was doing a lot of beating and doing a lot of making, but not a lot of dancing. And I had a friend who is a contemporary dancer and a pow dancer. And she started this all indigenous collective um, where we could safely meet like distance in a giant theater. And she got like a grant to do it. It was very nice. Uh, but we're all indigenous dancers from all different backgrounds. So how it would work was somebody would come and they would open the circle with either a song or a story or a prayer in, from our culture. And then another person would talk about their artistic practice. And then the third person would lead a movement part. Um, and it was so intimidating. It was the first time that I had to like confront like, well, not the first time, but like in this context, really confronting imposter syndrome as a dancer where I was just like, oh, in burlesque, I've been, I could do that in my sleep. I've been doing it for 16 years. <laughs> but then to be like, I'm, uh, these people are like trained dancers for, you know, as long and like, what are they gonna think about my art form? And like having to confront that and be like, I don't care, just present and do and be. And it was so lovely uh, because the connections I made through that um, kind of, that, that community led into like all these other things. So uh, from that, I got offered a job to work with an indigenous contemporary dance company. And I tried to talk my way out of that because I didn't think I could do it. Uh, so the uh, director of that company, the choreographer, uh, her name is Barbara Daibo, and she's this amazing dancer from my community. Uh, she's a contemporary ballet powwow. She does everything, hip hop. Um, and she had this piece. So she's like, Lauren, I'd really like to bring you on. And I told her, I don't think I can do it. And she's like, ah. she says, I have a budget and I have time. And she's like, it's going to be a lot of work. It's 40 hours a week. And it's like months of training, but I'm going to train you and we're going to do it. So. I took the job and we're like, I'm part of this touring dance company now, which is really, really great. So all that to say, to bring that back to burlesque, it's definitely like, again, influencing like just my energy, like going back into this art form that I love so much. Um, And that is really like this idea of like collaborative work of like group work of, and also, there's like a lot of humility in like the past few months. That, like, I've been out of my comfort zone for so long. It's really, really nice to, to have this feeling of like, it's, 
I've been the storyteller for so long and I've been telling the stories that I want to tell and like kind of to be a vessel for somebody else's vision and somebody else's work. It's so humbling. And, and so like it, it's, it felt like a gift, you know, where I'm like, I, well, you're a dancer, you know, Michelle. <laughs> no, I know. But, but yeah, burlesque is, it's not super collaborative. Um, it's such a solo, I mean, it can be, you know, if you're collaborating with, um, customers or, um, producers or whatever, but it, for the most part, everyone is doing everything themselves. So yeah. that, uh, collaboration is so nice, especially coming out of a pandemic and to feel that connection in that way. is So great. Yeah. Well, it's so wonderful to have you and thank you so much for sharing your heart and your experience with us. I really appreciate it. Oh, I love you. <laughs> yeah. Back at you, babe. So tell us where we can find you and um, see you dance. All right. So I'm going to check on my phone because <laughs> yes, <laughs> like my brain has gone with the pandemic, um, but it's never, I will be in the U S I will be performing in the U S I'm going to be performing at um, Midwest undressed and that's going to be in Cincinnati and that's going to be on the 6th of November. And then I'm going to be performing in Wisconsin. It's going to be a really fun show. It's going to be called Mondo Lucha. It is called Mondo Lucha. And it is a wrestling burlesque extravaganza. So yeah, I'll be All doing right. that. Awesome. that. And where are you? How, are you? how do we find you on Instagram? Oh, yes. Um, it's at Lulu La Duchesse. I am super shadow banned. So you will have to probably put in that whole name. L-O-U-L-O-U-L-A-D-U-C-H-E-S-S-E. Yes. <laughs> Take out that space, Lulu. Oh, <laughs> Take up all that space. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lulu. And all of you, make sure that you follow her and you can follow us at I Look Down There and me at Michelle Lamore. And remember that confidence comes from the bottom up. So grab a mirror and look down there. Thank you. Thank you.